Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Savin, and I work for Netflix. I am here today to talk about our machine learning infrastructure that enables our data scientists to build, run, and deploy their machine learning projects at scale. Uh, so today, I'll give a brief primer about uh, the variety of different machine learning activities happening at Netflix. I'll introduce Metaflow, our machine learning platform. And I'll go over some of the philosophical underpinnings uh, that we learned uh, and observed uh, while we were building this platform. This talk is a continuation of a talk that was given by my colleague last year uh, at Brisbane. And uh, yeah, so let's let's start about let's start to talk about what does Netflix do. So this is a very high-level overview of our service. So every single month, consumers like you give us money. And then we are responsible uh, to take that money and invest that in content and marketing. And if we buy good content and if we surface relevant content to you, then you will, of course, enjoy our service and you'll keep on paying us and we'll buy more and more content. Now, in order to keep delivering on the cycle of joy, we need to get smarter. Uh, we need to be smarter in terms of how we program our content, how do we effectively market to our users worldwide, how do we effectively recommend content when you open our app, uh, how do we place our content on our content distribution caches so that next time when you start streaming something, you don't run into any of the rebuffers. And these are all the different places where machine learning helps us be successful and be smarter. Some of the smattering of projects that are currently underway are listed here, and these go all the way from title portfolio optimization, figuring out how to classify our support tickets, analyzing screenplays, uh, figuring out how much we should pay for any given piece of content. Uh, so quite a diverse set of problems that we are tackling these days. Our data scientists who are responsible for figuring out solutions to these problems, they also come from a variety of different backgrounds. Uh, economics, econometrics, public policy, sociology, computer science, physics. So in a nutshell, we have a diverse set of problems being solved by a diverse set of people, all in the goal of making Netflix smarter. And for that, they need a machine learning infrastructure that makes them productive and that allows them to do their job uh, without any distractions. So this is our current tech stack at Netflix. So we run on AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services. So our data lake is built on top of S3. All of the data at Netflix lives in S3. Uh, people access that data either directly or via a query engine, which in most cases is either Spark or Presto. Uh, we have a container orchestration system called Titus. Uh, it's open source. Uh, an open source equivalent uh, that you might be more familiar with would be Kubernetes or Docker Swarm. Our job scheduler is Mason, so people schedule their workflows on Mason, which then triggers and places jobs on instances that are orchestrated by Titus. Uh, an open source equivalent for Mason would be Airbnb's Airflow. Our users use hosted notebooks uh, from the Jupyter project. Uh, Intract is another project um, that was spawned at Netflix. And uh, we also provide them the capability to spin up their own virtual machines on top of which they can use RStudio IDE to uh, write their code. And they are free to use any machine learning libraries, any packages that are available on CRAN. Uh, a lot of users, they write their own packages uh, that we host internally for us. So, if you are a data scientist at Netflix, essentially, uh, what you're going to do is you're going to use whatever your favorite tool is, your favorite packages, you're going to use your favorite IDE, which in most cases uh, would be RStudio if your lingua franca is R, and off you'll go. Once you have productionized something, it's production ready, then you'll move it on to Mason. Uh, if you want to run things on GPUs, for example, or if you want to scale out vertically, you would access more and more resources using titles, and all of the data access uh, happens through either custom high-performance libraries or via query engines like Spark. All right, so now, if we look at uh, the life cycle of a machine learning project from a data scientist's point of view, 
this is this is what it looks like from a very very high level, right? You get some data, you perform some compute on it, doing some analysis, doing some feature engineering, training a model. You get some output uh, that is then consumed by another engineering system or by a business stakeholder to drive some business value at the end of the day. But the reality is not really that straightforward, right? Uh, the compute that you're doing, uh, you might not have enough resources on your local dev box or your laptop, so you might want to scale it out. You might need access to GPUs. You might want to do distributed training. Uh, you might want to access data at a very high throughput. You want to schedule your model updates so that every single time you have a fresh batch of data, your model training process kicks up or every single day, every single week, uh, your model gets refreshed. You would want to monitor the quality of your models. You want to iterate on top of them. You would want to make sure that other people can collaborate effectively on the same models. They can fork off your models and build on top of that. And you know, suddenly the problem seems less data science problem, but more of a data engineering or a systems engineering problem, which oftentimes data scientists are not really well equipped to deal with. So this is how much a data scientist cares about things, right? If, if I'm a data scientist, then I care more about, I have expressed opinions about what sort of machine learning libraries I want to use rather than what sort of job scheduler is available to me or whether my employer is using Titus or Kubernetes or Docker Swarm, whether we are running on HDFS or S3, how the data is laid out. Uh, while the infrastructure that is needed uh, is entirely the other way around. And this is where Metaflow essentially comes in. So Metaflow is our machine learning platform that recognizes the human limitations uh, to make sure that our data scientists are as productive as possible. So let's, let's see what Metaflow does. So Metaflow, uh, the philosophical uh, objective of Metaflow is that our data scientists are really good at data science, and we need to make sure that they are able to achieve their goals and drive business value for Netflix as quickly as possible, as productively as possible, uh, without any distractions. We also want to make sure that as they move their projects from prototype to production, uh, there isn't necessarily a handover between data scientists and engineers who then end up re-implementing uh, their models in an entirely different tech stack where the data scientist then loses the ability to iterate rapidly on the product. And we also want to make sure that collaboration is sort of dealt as a first-class citizen in this model. Uh, let's dive a little bit deeper into how Metaflow achieves these objectives. So, Metaflow ensures that, or it allows our users to uh, basically represent their machine learning flows as a direct ID cycle graph. And we feel that it's, it's a very natural way of uh, declaring your machine learning workflows because a lot of technical benefits emanate when you represent your workflow as a graph. You can, fig you can make sure that you know, your specific nodes in your graph, they uh, execute in a specific kind of environment with specific set of dependencies and so on and so forth. You can introduce checkpointing and all. Uh, and this is one example, one very simplistic flow of how Metaflow achieves that. So on my left, we have a very simple and straightforward example. Uh, so the Metaflow library, it introduces a few functions. Uh, the first function is Metaflow, uh, which sort of like just declares the name of your flow. And then we have, uh, smattering of functions called step. Uh, so we have five steps corresponding to five steps of the flow. Uh, the first step, it represents the start node. Uh, it also has the next step attribute, which uh, points to all the state transitions that need to happen when the start step is successful. And it includes the actual user function that needs to execute. Uh, this user function, is uh, a function that takes in an environment uh, called self. And we require our users to essentially associate all the variables that they need to pass around to this environment. So in this example, uh, they would essentially associate myware uh, to self as hello world. Another function, uh, another step A, they can then get access to the myware value uh, as here in this example, just doing self dollar myware. Now, this is a standard R code, and if they are using RStudio ID or a notebook or just Vim Emacs, 
they can just execute as they are used to executing any of their workflow. And because we have a DAG, uh, what we do is whenever users are executing their workflow, behind the scenes, Metaflow runtime will capture the entirety of the state and it will persist that into S3. So if let's say you run into any error and you want to resume your workflow, uh, we then go to S3, uh, pull back the entire state and we are able, uh, the user is able to then continue the compute uh, from the last step. So as I mentioned before, right, like the big goal of Metaflow is to make sure that our users are able to do what they uh, really want to achieve, which is data science. Uh, here's another example of how users would essentially do some model training in Metaflow. So let's say we have a step called fit models, uh, and they can use one of the amazing libraries that's available in R, Carrot, uh, to train a GBM model. So we have uh, the input self, uh, and you can have previous steps where you might have associated some of the parameters to the input variable that you can associate uh, with Param. Uh, all the features and the labels are also available to you from one of the prior steps. Uh, then you train your model as you would do in any of your other R code. And then in the end, you will just associate your model and your fit to the self um, environment. This essentially allows our users to focus on feature engineering, training logic, format of the output, making sure that you know, like, they are able to leverage their skill sets to the maximum while Metaflow essentially takes away the entire pain around scalability, scheduling, all the DevOps work. So here's another example uh, that will sort of make things a little bit more concrete. So in this example, uh, I have a flow that I call Big Sum flow, and uh, it has a bunch of steps, uh, four steps actually. Um, so the first step uh, is essentially declaring an array of uh, three elements, 10,000, 40,000, 80,000. And in the next step, uh, A, what we are trying to do is we are trying to compute a matrix, uh, 10,000 cross 10,000, 40,000 cross 40,000, 80,000 cross 80,000. And then we are trying to sum up all the elements uh, in that matrix. Now, a 10,000 cross 10,000 matrix will take roughly eight gigs of memory. 40,000 cross 40,000 will take roughly 16 gigs. 80,000 cross 80,000 will take roughly 64 gigs. And if you are executing this on your laptop, um, chances are that you would run out of memory. Um, and if, let's say, you, know, you want to make sure that you're able to get to, uh, so if, if you want to make sure that you're able to, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so you would want to make sure that you're able to request more and more memory, uh, more and more resources, and we allow these decorators. Uh, so in this example, you can have a decorator called Titus where you can request 600 megs of memory, which is going to be more than enough for your use case. And what we'll do behind the scenes is that we'll execute the start step locally on your box, and then we'll ship off the compute onto our Titus cluster. We'll request three different instances to execute these uh, compute in parallel we'll bring back the results for you in the join step, and then we'll finish the flow for you. And once you are happy with the results, then you can use the command Mason equals create to actually push this workflow onto our Mason scheduler uh, without doing any of the actual extra work. Uh, we also want to make sure that uh, collaboration is treated as a first class entity. Uh, it's very difficult to collaborate in machine learning projects and uh, not just collaborating with others, but collaborating with self, right? You have a model that you have now pushed into production, you want to iterate on other different variants, how do you do that? Now, Metaflow by default versions every single execution it stores, every single state transition in S3. It allows users to annotate their workflows uh, in a human readable format so that they can organize their workflows. And it provides easy access to all the code data and the results so that people can go back, uh, roll back their versions, they can figure out what works, what doesn't, track different experiments, and collaborate with. Uh, one artifact of storing every single uh, object uh, 
persisting every single object in S3 is that we can then offer our users a client library where they can go back and look at all the historical results. They can track their models, uh, how they are behaving. Uh, they can, using this client API, they can embed their models in Shiny apps and essentially just be self-served in terms of deploying their model in any sort of um, business activity. Another aspect of collaboration is reproducible research. So let's say you know you built a model and now you've moved on to a different project. There's a new employee who walks into the company and now they want to build on top of your model, right? Because we have immutable snapshots of every single object uh, in S3, uh, and we manage all the external dependencies, the entire environment for our users, they can very easily just fork off the code and they can reproduce the past results and they can just go and uh, iterate on the model that were built by somebody else without actually stepping over any of the production versions. Uh, all of this gets us pretty close to the holy grail of reproducible research without actually relying on any sort of version control system like Git, Docker files, or maintaining any cumbersome configuration files. Uh, everything just happens in code. We have, this was just a very small set of features uh, because I just had 15 minutes to talk to you. Uh, we have a lot of features, uh, so we support both Python and R. The Metaflow library is actually written predominantly in Python, and then we use the Reticulate project to provide bindings for R. Uh, we have high throughput data access libraries that we have written on top of Apache Arrow, both for Python and R. Uh, using the client API, our users can embed their models in a variety of different microservices. We provide a serverless a service, a service uh, compute model where they can just define a function and then we host that function uh, as a microservice for them. Uh, we also enable flexible parameterization of the workflows, uh, flexible scheduling policies, uh, as well as isolated environments for managing third-party and second-party dependencies. We also have Slack bots so that people can just trigger their workflows and be notified when uh, things execute. So that's me, that's Metaflow, and open for questions. All right, that was, that was awesome. Um, maybe time for one question while we switch speakers. Any takers, any takers? Hi, thank you for the very interesting talk. Uh, the question I have is, uh, I saw a part where you can scale up the uh, uh, computation. But yes. Uh, if that requires passing a lot of data to the server, is it going to be uh, causing issues or would you advise against doing that if your data is actually really huge on your computer to start with? So uh, what we require our users is we ask them to store their data in S3. And that's the reason why we provide all of the high throughput data access libraries so that within their step they can just access data from S3. And also, uh, even if you have a lot of data, like a lot of data, the definition of a lot is in the eye of the beholder, uh, honestly. And uh, depending on your use case, at times it might be just simple and straightforward to pass that data around. Uh, in other cases, you might just want to dump that data in S3 and just access it. Uh, 